you know, Webb was conceived of, believe it or not, in the late 1980s, even before yeah. Hubble ever launched. So we all knew that, okay, there would be a need. Yes, Hubble's going to be great. The space telescope thing is going to be fantastic. We're, we're going to get images and, and spectra of resolution and clarity that we've never been able to achieve before. But we also understood even then that this was an optical, aka visible light telescope. Mm. Now you might say, well, fine, that's that's great. We, we see in the visible part of the spectrum, duh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's so much information out there that's coming to us at other wavelengths. And among them, are the infrared part of the spectrum. We knew that the most distant galaxies are going to be incredibly redshifted. We would need to be able to see their infrared light in order to see them at all. They're so far away. Mm. So a large infrared telescope was understood as the next big thing that we've got to do right after Hubble. Unless you've been living under a rock for the last couple of weeks, you have seen the first images that came out of the Webb Space Telescope. I covered it on my channel, everybody and their dog has covered it, and I, like many of you I'm sure, just wanted to talk to people about it. Uh, so what better person to talk to about it than an actual astronomer? And I happen to know an actual astronomer, Christian Reddy, from the YouTube channel Launchpad Astronomy. So we hopped on the old Zoom and we talked about it. Now, I want to say before we get into this, if you're one of those audio listeners, if you just listen to it on audio, some people do just listen to it there, which ironically was kind of the whole point in the beginning. This whole podcast was supposed to just be audio only. But uh, anyway, one of the downsides of audio only is that you can't actually, you know, see what we're talking about. And there are parts of this podcast where we're looking at specific um, things in the web images that obviously you can't see. Uh, but I do upload these video versions of this on uh, YouTube so you can see it there. I want to just thank Christian for chatting with me. We had some technical issues, but I really enjoy catching up and hearing his take on this. But with that, I will shut up and get into my conversation with Christian Reddy. I have been wondering ever since we uh, set this up, have I, and, and please forgive me if this is rude, have we met before? Yes, we have. We have. Where? What did we yeah, meet? You, so you and I, we, we had a chat a couple years ago. Uh, I was uh -huh. uh, I was kind of new to the YouTube game and uh, and I said, hey man, you know, can we get together and chat uh, and talk? And and you were very kind. Uh, oh, we, we just a did Zoom a Zoom call. thing. We did a Zoom thing and we were just, you and me just talking. Okay. Uh, and then I, uh, and then, and then, you know, after you gave me your sage advice, then you asked me to be on uh, on the OLF show. So I, uh, so you know, we did a an impromptu uh, interview right there. Okay. You know? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, I didn't know that the video was on, so I was just sitting back in my chair. I was like, I was back over here. I was like this. <laughs> I was in a camera. You know. <laughs> That's and uh, and they introduced me as a Christian from Launchpad Astronomy. I'm like, they didn't even know my last name. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's cool. It's all. It's all I, fun. That I thought it was. I thought it was hilarious. I thought, oh man, that's fantastic. <laughs> well, my my lot in life has always been that I'm really good with faces and terrible with names. So I walk around doing that a lot because i never yeah can i'm the same way remember quite exactly but, but so same thing with you i was like i know i've talked to him somewhere before but i can't remember where yeah. and that was that was it yeah for sure sure okay, you know it's funny crazy. no you're not crazy and you know what i mean i i have students walk up to me you know hey professor reddy and i'm like hey you yeah. <laughs> uh, i know you i know you and you know so i'm always asking people for their names well talk about Third, that for a second what what uh what's your yeah. uh, profession of professor or Oriel? Uh, yeah, so so I uh, I'm I'm a professor down at Towson University outside of Baltimore, mm -hmm. and I teach introductory astronomy. That's primarily the the courses that I teach, and and actually it's a course that I love to teach because you know you're taking people who let's face it they have to be there they they had they had to take <laughs> some kind of core requirement, um, you know they thought physics is too hard, chemistry is messy, biology is yucky. Uh, geology it's a bunch of rocks i don't know and then i end up teaching them most of those topics in the course of astronomy you know mm -hmm. so like they kind of they kind of get into this stuff whether they realize it or not you know but mm -hmm. um but they all seem to enjoy it. they they find that i'll be honest they, they find that the class is typically a, a little bit harder than they expected it would be mm -hmm. you know it's actually not just knowing the constellations in fact i don't teach constellations very much um, mm -hmm. and depending on the class i might be talking about the dynamics of planetary atmospheres or 
if it's the other class, I might be talking about, you know, how stars evolve and die and the expansion of the universe and all that kind of fun stuff. Mm -hmm. So they're getting a pretty good, broad overview of everything. And then they usually ask me, is there an introductory version of this class? And I said, you're in it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Can you step back? No. Yeah, right. Actually, but you know what? They, they tell me that they really like it. I, and, and that's great. That's why I love I love talking uh, to folks about it. They they usually find that uh, by the end of it, this was actually not a bad class after all. And, hmm. and you know, sometimes they even say that uh, I didn't do a terribly bad job teaching them either. So I'm, I'm pretty happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that matters. I'm happy when the reviews come in and, and I see things like, hey, he, this guy did not really suck all that much. I'm like, yes, that's, you know, <laughs> I win. <laughs> I only hated this a little bit. Yeah, uh, exactly. that, that's interesting, though, because you were talking about um, that they that they come in and maybe they have no interest in astronomy at all. It's just no like right. they just have to take it or whatever. But then they kind of over time develop an interest in it or something or that that light switches on, so to speak. Yeah. Um, I've thought about this a lot, actually, just since these these uh, web images came out, which we'll get to here in a second. But sure. um, but, you know, it's 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 funny because like there are some people that just literally are brought to tears by it. I mean, I've heard yeah. some people talk about they were literally just crying looking at them. Oh, yeah. And then and then you'll show it to other people and just be like, it's a bunch of stars. <laughs> <laughs> and, and to me, yep. it's just like, how can you not be awed by that? But some people are like, this has no bearing on my life. You know, like this doesn't put oh, food on my table. Yeah. This doesn't solve the problems in society and everything. Like, why are we spending time with this? And yeah. I'm, I kind of struggle sometimes. Like, I get where they're coming from. But I guess, I guess my take on it, and I would love to hear your thought here. Sure. Um, but it's like, um, it's kind of like the whole Carl Sagan pale blue dot thing, mm -hmm. right? Like it, it just kind yes, of puts absolutely. all of our problems in perspective of like, you know, all the things that we fight about all the time. It's like, it really doesn't matter in the big picture. And the things really like this doesn't. kind of bring that to, to light. And I feel like if more people had that bigger picture perspective on the world, yeah. if we all did, I know that's, that's impossible, but you know, if we all had that perspective, <laughs> I just think the world would be a better place. I agree with you a hundred percent. I mean, there, there, there's no question about this. Uh, we can, we can, if we can spend, you know, yes, there's money and resources that go into this, right? There's, there's a lot, there's a lot of money and yes, I know web costs a lot more to build and, and launch than expected. We all know that we all, a lot of lessons learned there, you know, uh, <laughs> it's not lost on NASA. It's not lost on the astronomical community either. But the truth of the matter is that we do these things because we are insatiably curious people and we need to, we have this, you were mentioning Sagan, you know, I think he also would talk, he would often talk about things like we have this thirst for knowledge, we have this thirst for understanding. And while that sounds very easy for me to say as a college professor, you know, oh, we have a thirst for understanding, like, yeah, you don't have to deal with anything else. No, I got a tree down in my backyard. You kidding me? Yeah, I've got things to deal with too, yeah, right? Yeah. We got, we all have real everyday real world problems, but I agree with that. I think it's important that we keep some perspective. And I do wish that more people had uh, an understanding of this uh, or an appreciation of this, because I think once you gain that appreciation, this is why people are moved to tears, because they know how much hard work went into this. They know what these images represent. They know what, what levels of details that they are seeing in these images that they had hoped to see, but never really thought they would see. They would have been happy with a little less detail because it mm -hmm. still would have been more than what we had before. And they're getting more than what we expected, you know, and this is the joy of it all, right? The, 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 the hard work, the engineering, the everything from the guy writing software to the, to the girl processing the image, right? It's like, it all comes down to like what people are able to do when they decide to work together and decide to get things done. Yeah. Sure, we can spend a bunch of money, but you know, I mean, I'm just going to quote. Uh, there's this really great philosopher uh, on YouTube. His name's Hank Green, and he <laughs> said, <laughs> he said, and I think this is just the best way to describe it. You know, yes, government needs to decrease the suck. Yes, government needs to help you know ease people suffering and make sure there's food for everybody, but. Mm -hmm. If all we do is decrease the suck, no one's going to appreciate it. No one's thankful. Everyone's always complaining about, you know, gas prices are high. Gas mm -hmm. prices have been coming down week after week, you know, and we still pay a lot less than the rest of the world for yeah. a gallon of gas, right? And I get that, you know, and besides, we ought to be transitioning to energy, uh, renewable energy anyway. There's all of these things that we complain about, even as things get better. And if, so if government just decreases the suck, as Hank Green would say, right? 
no one's going to appreciate it. But government needs to be able to take a percentage of that investment, just a, just a small amount, and use it to increase the awesome, right? Do great <laughs> things that we can only do together, you know, and that is where web is, right? It is the epitome of increasing the awesome. Now we have something to appreciate. Now we have something to get excited about. Now we have something to rally behind. And now we have something that helps us to hopefully, as, as you point out, help maybe just remember that, you know what, we are a civilization on that pale blue dot. And mm -hmm. if we can't get excited about that, then we're doing it wrong. And I, and I recognize that not everybody gets excited about that, but it is important. And no matter the cost, I know the cost is high, but honestly, it's still a drop in the bucket. We're talking, yes, $10 billion over 20 years. Mm. Well, and Come also on. I've always made this argument, especially with the, the Mars rovers and stuff. People, people act like you just literally are sticking <clears throat> lovely sorry about that uh people <laughs> act like you're just sticking 20 billion dollars in a rocket and launching it into space no the that no. Uh, those 10 billion dollars went to people that were working yes. on this and got put into the economy like it didn't just vanish exactly you know, it wasn't wasted it's still out there yeah it's exactly around. right it's all back in the sea man it's all it's all flying around out there we're we're, we're, we're earning it we're spending it we're earning it now you know if you give if you give a bunch of tax breaks to people who don't need them you know well then they're more than likely just to stick it in the bank you know and yeah, it doesn't yeah. go back into the economy but you know what these are just ordinary average working people right you know mm -hmm. i mean they got they got jobs they got families they got bills to pay yeah that money gets spent and it how goes many back people worked economy. on it like two hundred thousand people or something like that or was it oh, like I can't imagine. 87 I, I, billion people. <laughs> I mean, it was a lot of people, right? I mean, yeah. I, I worked on the Hubble Space Telescope and, uh, you know, I, I could never even begin to tell you how many people total from the moment it was conceived of to today, you know, right. have been involved with that mission. That's Hubble. Well, Webb's been around, you know, Webb was conceived of believe it or not, in the late 1980s, even before mm -hmm. Hubble ever launched. Mm -hmm. So we all knew that, okay, there would be a need. Yes, Hubble is going to be great. The space telescope thing is going to be fantastic. We're, we're going to get images and, and spectra of resolution and clarity that we've never been able to achieve before. But we also understood even then that this was an optical, aka visible light telescope. Mm -hmm. Now you might say, well, fine, that's, that's great. We, we see in the visible part of the spectrum, duh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's so much information out there that's coming to us at other wavelengths. And among them are the infrared part of the spectrum. We knew that the most distant galaxies are going to be incredibly redshifted. We would need to be able to see their infrared light in order to see them at all. They're so far away. Mm. So a large infrared telescope was understood as the next big thing that we've got to do right after Hubble. So you go back to the number of people who were working on it. Again, this started off in like 1987 or 1988 was when a couple of guys were tasked by the director of the Space Telescope Science Institute to get working on it. So, okay, that was three. <laughs> and it kind of grew from there, right? You know, and it, there were the and original like, three people. Right. Now it's like 30,000 or however many it is. It's yeah. a crazy amount of people who've had to work on it. Yeah. So you worked on Hubble. Yeah, I did. I don't yeah, think I knew that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was my claim to fame. Um, so first job out of college, you know, I'm just a kid. Moved down to, <laughs> I moved down to Baltimore. And it was downhill from there. <laughs> and it was all downhill from there, man. And here I am. Now Now I've got a YouTube channel. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, that, that's, that's, that's what I'm always telling people. It's like, you know, I, I went to college, did all these things, and now I have the same career as a 13-year-old. <laughs> exactly yes <laughs> there you go and and uh, and they're coming for our jobs joe so, exactly. you know we got it we got <laughs> and they're, it and they're better know. than we are yeah they're doing a better job yeah so i i still don't understand tiktok uh, how how sad is that you know so <laughs> yeah i'm struggling myself to, to understand yeah that. but it's it, so, even but the second you do understand it it will have changed and yes. it's something that you don't understand anymore but yeah that's these, a whole other the, the, these these kids today with their talks and their uh snap chat uh grams uh whatever there <laughs> with your, yeah, get off my lawn oh i tell you with back your in my day talks. oh back in my day you know we only had yeah so back in my day <laughs> right you know uh that before the well i won't say before the internet because the internet was around for a long long time before mm -hmm. that but yeah you know that was back when like oh i have an email address you know like yeah. ooh, that's kind of cool you've got you mail know? 
Yeah, and I'm I'm reading Usenet news groups on my lunch hour, mm. and sometimes a little bit after my lunch hour too. I must confess, but uh, that was a state of the internet back then, and that's really back in the day when it was largely a way for well beyond the military for institutions mm. to share information. And being that I'm working at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, you know, it's a science institution. Sure, yeah. yeah, people are people are sending pictures back and forth. But you know, I, I had a I have a lot of great memories of working on on Hubble. I, I was a I was what's called a program coordinator. And and it sounds kind of like a generic term, but basically what that means is I'm one of the I'm one of the people who was responsible for taking observation proposals that other astronomers had for Hubble mm, okay. and implementing them into a series of commands and scheduling windows and things like that, that would ultimately be uploaded to the telescope for flight cool. and, and for execution. So I was, I, I joke that like, oh yeah, I, I took that picture, you know, or something like that, but <laughs> nobody takes a picture. It's, you know, I just, I just helped you, set up those you press the button. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's all I did. I just sat in, I just sat in the control center and just guided the telescope with my bare hands and, right. you know, using a joystick and, you know, decided to take the exposure. Yeah. Well, I would love to hear your take on this because I've heard some people talking about that there's some interesting, um, I guess, opportunities to use web and uh, Hubble together. Yeah. That they can kind of like, because, um, you know, they, they, do, they do use different wavelengths of, of light and whatnot. Like, are there any, could you speak to that a little bit? Because I'd heard somebody sure. say that there's, there's some opportunities there and I didn't know exactly how that would work, but it sounds like you would have a good well uh, yeah you know unfortunately i don't have uh, a list of all those what are called cycle one observing programs for web in front of me but uh, but i do know that yeah this was like a big big hope of the astronomical community i mean we have these two you know major flagship uh space telescopes now which let's face it you know hubble's so old we didn't know we would get this lucky and here we are yeah, right you know exactly. uh, hubble's old and web was getting delayed so now they're here they're both and and hubble is still working well i mean it's 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 older it, you know needs a little more tlc but it it's still working very very well mm -hmm. and web is is a freshly minted uh flagship observatory so you have these two telescopes and yes there are intentions there are plans observing programs in the pipeline to do various kinds of you know co-observations now they probably would not be turning to look at the exact same target at the exact same time because that would be probably a scheduling nightmare that would be very very difficult to do um you know both telescopes are in very high demand and their time is extremely precious in fact that's the most important thing everyone talks about the money we care mostly about the time right how do we keep these observatories as efficient as possible you know and so there are going to be like for example uh We've seen we've already seen in these initial release images from from Webb, uh, you know, some galaxy clusters and uh, the Southern Ring Nebula and all these other beautiful images. Well, guess what? They were all previously imaged with Hubble. Yeah. yeah. You know, so that's part of the reason why they were chosen. Right. Because it's a way of taking optical observations by Hubble and now doing some follow up science mm -hmm. with them now, granted they were also chosen because they're they're known quantities right they're pretty you know they make <laughs> they, they they make good they make good photos you yeah. know but there's now a chance there's an opportunity here to take these two data sets and compare them to each other because you're always yeah. going to learn something at different wavelengths right there's new information at all different uh, bands of wavelengths so as far as any direct one-to-one -one, a, a real-time observing campaigns with both telescopes i'm not aware of them but that doesn't mean that that's off the table. I just know that it would be a little bit difficult to schedule. But yeah, there's definitely going to be lots of lots of cool stuff going on. Uh, an another, um, I, I know that another thing that would probably kick off like a web uh, Hubble real time collab would be something on the order of like a comet smashing into Jupiter again, mm -hmm. right? Like we had in 1994, mm -hmm. that, that wonderful comet. Shoemaker Shoemaker Libby. Libby. Oh man, that was good times. That was yeah. good times. I, I was, <laughs> I was at the Institute then. It was fantastic. It was awesome. Oh, yeah. was and uh, I know that if something like that were to happen, Oh, you bet that both telescopes plus virtually every other telescope yeah. on the ground and, and the others in space would all be looking at that at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't, uh, didn't Webb take a picture of, of Jupiter? Yes, yes. I saw that like the next day or something. Yeah, yeah. So uh, these were those were released on Thursday. Yeah, let's bring them up. Uh, those are released on Thursday, and those are the funny thing about these images that came out of Jupiter. They're actually calibration images. 
Okay, so they're not really even right. intended for science. But you know what? You you give a scientist data, it doesn't matter how you know good or bad the data is. You know, astronomers are going to do stuff with that, right? And so my friend uh, Dr. Heidi Hamill, she was involved in uh, in in some of these uh, observations. Yeah, look at that, right? Yeah. So now we're seeing through. This is the great thing about Jupiter. So uh, we're seeing through a lot of the hazes. So you've got some color images there. Uh, of Jupiter on the on the left, and now you got this beautiful infrared image of Jupiter. Now you might look at it and go, "Well, it doesn't look all that pretty." Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But <laughs> forget the colors, man. Uh -huh. Think about what we're seeing. Think about the information we're seeing through those hazes, and we're revealing layers and details. And no, these are not fully processed images, right? These are quote unquote just calibration images. Right. So this the this holy mackerel. This okay. star thing, that's uh, that's one of the uh, moons, right? That is one of the moons. And you notice that the moon is blacked out, right? Yeah. The moon. So what's happened is that the detectors on web, uh, you know, they're, they're CCDs. So they're not, you know, they're kind of like the chips in our cameras that take pictures, right? Well, when these CCDs saturate, they stop taking data, you know, so they just to prevent them from getting destroyed, these cameras are designed to just basically turn off those pixels. Mm. And that's why uh, it's it's blacked <clears throat> out. Uh, if you took a shorter exposure, and, and this exposure was not intended to image the moon, it was intended to image Jupiter. So, right. you know, the fail safe tripped on the on the camera and we just have that, uh, we have that beautiful image of Jupiter. So I just think that's really cool. And, you know, with some more processing, it can be, it can be made to look prettier, but man, I mean, I just really am digging that. And I, and the, the, here the 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 intensity obviously about. refers to heat right <laughs> <laughs> well there if, if you go back to that image right you'll yeah. notice that the great red spot is down there and the great red spot is white yeah. that's important because what that what that confirms is that is a chimney right that's what the great red spot is that's i heat. mean yes it's a storm right that's heat and it's kind of like a window into Jupiter's interior. So you've got like this chimney, so to speak, of internal heat coming from the planet, rising through the great red spot. And it's just amazing to see where, you know, we, we always kind of had a feeling that was the case, but to actually see it like this is just, wow, that's so cool. You know? Okay. So, so yeah. my assumption seeing that mm -hmm. was that because the winds are moving so fast and spiraling so fast that it's sort of like atmospheric friction and that's creating the heat. You're saying it's more like there's internal heat from inside the planet that's coming out through there. That's right. Exactly. So why is that happening? Uh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are some theories and so forth. And actually, you know, like I'm not a planetary scientist, so I'm veering way out of my lane here. But mm. uh, I'll, yeah, I mean, it's always been a little bit of a of a mystery first of all like why is the great red spot even there i mean yeah storms on jupiter uh don't have to contend with making landfall like a hurricane does here on earth so it's not like it's ever going to just run out of energy mm. but but storms on jupiter we've seen them come and go we've seen them start from nothing get really big and maybe merge with another storm get even bigger and then they fizzle out you know just mm. that's what you'd expect right why is the great red spot still there after all of these years. In fact, yeah. when I say all these years, you know, we're talking maybe hundreds of years, at least, at least, a, at least 200 years, but you know, there's even some suspicion that maybe Galileo yeah, might have yeah. seen the Great Red Spot back in 1609. So we know this is a very long lived storm. And so what's so great, what's so special about the Great Red Spot? I mean, it's very big, but it's also shrinking, right? Yeah. It's actually, it's actually smaller today than it used to be. It used to be, you know, back in my day, you know, it used to be, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, well, let's see, back in the 70s, I guess it was roughly about twice the size of Earth. Today, it's a little bit larger than about like 1.3 Earths. Uh -huh. So we know that it's shrinking, but it's also becoming more circular and it's growing taller. Mm. And so it's becoming more and more of that chimney, uh, as I describe it, where it's now just a, a conduit uh, for Jupiter's internal heat. So it's very, very hot inside the planet. And you're seeing some of that heat manifesting itself in the great belt that's above it, which is glowing right. white. I was right? going to ask about that too. So is that, again, yeah. my, my assumption would be atmospheric friction, but you're saying maybe not so much? Well, I think it's, I think that could be a little bit of, attributed to a little bit of both. Uh, sure. But yeah, most of it, because uh, a lot of Jupiter's weather, all of it is driven by internal heat radiating mm -hmm. out. Uh, Jupiter radiates something like more than twice as much 
heat energy as it receives from the sun. Mm -hmm. So Jupiter is a furnace, right? It's it's yeah. putting out more energy than it's taking in. So we expect to see that energy manifesting itself in, in the clouds and belts. And you've got, these are convections, right? So you've got regions where heat is coming up. As the gas is cool, they get darker, they sink back to the bottom, they pick up more heat and the cycle repeats. Great red spot on the other hand, no, it's a chimney. You know, it's that that's hmm. the cool thing about this. Right. And it's like, why is that? Well, I'm sure that there are people smarter than me who have a have a much better understanding of it and a much better uh, interpretation of this. But largely, it's still unclear. And, and one thing I do know is very unclear is why exactly is it shrinking? Why exactly is it becoming taller? Webb can now help us to answer some of these critical questions. It, it, it's it's just that's really cool. It's just thrilling to see this image you know yeah. brown and muddy and yucky and all that kind of stuff yes yeah, well, yeah, this is fantastic you know this is at, awesome yeah, yeah. <clears throat> i mean it's, it's also thing. interesting that the 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 poles are hotter than i mean if i'm yeah. this, right the poles are, are hotter than the rest of the planet which is the opposite here obviously i would agree with that interpretation as a matter of fact jupiter is, jupiter's axial tilt is only like three degrees so it's kind of basically mm -hmm. you know it doesn't really have seasonal variation so both Poles are going to get roughly the same amount of heat energy from the sun, but holy mackerel, they they seem to be a net radiator of heat, and and that's something I didn't know before until I saw that image. You know, I mean, so mm -hmm. it's like this is this is cool. This is why we build telescopes like Webb. You know, to take the infrared signature of the cosmos. So I'm just digging that. So it's really yeah, cool. it's a trip. Yeah. Were there were there any others that were released? I thought I heard something about an asteroid that it might have imaged. There was a, there was something about an asteroid. Um, I just did a I, search for it and I didn't see anything come out. Let me see if I can find it here. Um, because there was, uh, yeah, I did see it. Um, and it looks like they haven't put it up on uh, ESA's website. Let me see if mm. I can find it uh, on uh, webtelescope.org. I'm going to head over there. But yeah, this is this is stuff that you can edit out, you know, as we, as we <laughs> fiddle around, try to you know, a couple of guys try to work out this, you know, how yeah. to use this internet machine here. But, um, but yeah, I did see something about an asteroid and, oh yeah. And, and one thing I do know about with the asteroid uh, image and truth, truth be told, partly with the uh, Jupiter image as well, is that web is designed, you know, all these objects are, tr are moving. Mm -hmm. And so whenever you are trying to take a picture of something that's moving, you have to be able to track it. So Webb has the ability, and that's what these images were designed to do, was to demonstrate Webb's, Webb's capability of being able to actually track these moving targets as they orbit the sun. And that's kind of hard to do in space and keep everything locked on tight. And, you know, yeah. when you're taking a, a picture of a bright object like Jupiter, yeah, that's one thing. But when you're taking a picture of a fainter object, such as an asteroid that, oh, by the way, is closer to the sun and is traveling faster across the sky, that's another. So the moving mm -hmm. target capability is a, a huge part of Webb's uh, portfolio. And fun fact, uh, there was a time when they thought maybe due to budget reasons, they would have to omit that capability. Mm. And the planetary community said, no, no, we're, we're building this. It's got to be able to track moving targets. Otherwise, what's the point? Well, <laughs> Other astronomers who don't track moving targets were like, well, I could use it for the, but you know, hey, you've got to be fair. You got <laughs> the stuff if, I Hubble, watch is like way out there. Right, exactly. Yeah. And and that Hubble has that capability and and Webb needs to have that capability as well. And, and I'm and, and that's what these images demonstrate. Yes, we can track targets as planned, as designed. So mm -hmm. it's just another cool little validation. And 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 I I'm probably gonna have to do a video about that because um because people see that and they think, oh, it's kind of gross. I'm like, no, 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 it's really, really cool, dude. <laughs> well, so in, in the little video that I did, I kept saying that these these images are basically test images. Is that a fair thing to say? Was I assuming something there? Because to me, it's like the, well, the first time you get any camera, you take a picture of a few things just to see how mm -hmm. it works. And it feels like that's kind of what those were. And the mind blower was we're already seeing things we've never seen before kind of thing. Um, well, I would say that uh, a lot of the test images that we saw came out over the spring right so when we saw that beautiful you know eight pointed star and yeah. all that kind of stuff right and that those were the initial test images that were designed to evaluate because remember you got 18 mirror segments that mm -hmm. all need to be phased together right they all gotta be, pretend that they're just one great big happy mirror right. uh so those images were certainly test images the images that were released on tuesday 
those were specifically designed uh, for public release to be things that we knew would make for pretty pictures. Again, we saw them with Hubble before and other telescopes. So we knew that there was something interesting there. And they were spe specially designed, uh, these observations were specially designed to be as full color as possible. And what we mean by that is taking pictures of different filters, right? So you get different mm -hmm. colors of infrared. Of course, you got to map some visible colors on top of those filters so that we can see it and interpret yeah. it. And we put together, we have a pretty picture. So they weren't test images. They were, they were very intentional observations. Still, what we find in those images are things that we still were not, we were still very surprised to see. So this episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream. And listen, if you think for one hot minute that they don't have some JWST content on there, then my friend, I don't even, I mean, you, you don't, you can have another, that's just crazy. That's crazy talk. Just stop that. But there are many documentaries on the JBST on Curiosity Stream. But if I were to pick just one, I would probably say to check out the Secrets of the Universe episode on the web. Uh, they went deep with behind the scenes access while they were building the web. And they have interviews with the people behind web, including John Mather, uh, who's been working on web pretty much from the very beginning. Uh, by the way, that whole series, Secrets of the Universe, is, is probably up your alley. They have episodes on Skylab, moon exploration, exoplanets. I know you're into that. And this is, of course, just one of thousands of documentaries on science, history, art. The list keeps going from some of the best filmmakers around the world. And while some other streaming services that shall go unnamed keep raising their prices, Curiosity Stream is insanely affordable. It's only $14.79 for an entire year when you use my URL, curiositystream.com slash Pod. But it gets even better because when you sign up for Curiosity Stream, you also get Nebula, the streaming service that I'm a part of, as well as many of your favorite smart YouTubers, where you can see our stuff ad-free and earlier than everybody else, meaning this podcast on Nebula wouldn't have this amazing ad read you're listening to right now. And it's also the only place that you can see my Nebula original series, Mysteries of the Human Body, and my brand new series called Forgotten Atrocities, where I take a look at some of the darker moments of human history that you may not have ever heard of. It's kind of kind of some dark stuff. But yeah, you get both of those services for only $14.79 for an entire year. It's almost impossible to get more bang for the buck. So again, to get all that, just go to curiositystream.com slash Pod. Again, that's curiositystream.com slash Pod, And you can get as lost in their library as I do. It happens every single time. So go check it out. And thanks to Curiosity Stream for supporting this podcast. Now back to Christian. So what you're looking at is this uh, small group of galaxies, right? This very tight group of galaxies. And no, this is not the web image. This is the Hubble image. This is the yeah. HST image. And yes, it's cockeyed. I did that on purpose because now I can reveal the web version yeah. of the image, right? And so I couldn't believe when we got into this. I mean, admittedly, this guy right here, this is a foreground galaxy. So all of these galaxies, including yeah. this one down here, they're all members of, quint of the quintet. I could not so the believe one on the left is the one that's kind of like closer to us. That's right. It's about, yeah, okay. it's about seven times closer to earth or one seventh the distance. So it's definitely a foreground object. It's not uh, it's a foreground galaxy. It's not associated with the group at all, but I want to go back to this for a second. That's nice. That's cool. That's pretty. Right. And then you go back to here and suddenly you're seeing through all that gas and dust. Mm -hmm. And yes, we expected that, but I did not expect to see nearly as many stars. Like oh, I knew that yeah. I knew that they were going to be doing Stefan's Quintet because they announced the the target list before they were released. And so I'm doing a little bit of research and I'm like, yeah, okay, we'll probably see some more stars. And holy moly. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> what? What? <laughs> Look at that. Look at that. Uh that 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 just totally wow, what a trip to it's just, you can almost start counting individual stars and and now we can do things like population counts. Like we can we can kind of see, okay, well, we know where the star formation is. We see that there's these really bright objects that are, you know, really bunched together. Those are clusters and associations of newborn stars. Mm -hmm. But then you get into all this stuff down here, these little freewheeling stars out there. And to be able to see how the populations are distributed and what you don't find is that while there is some correlation to the spiral arms, uh, you know, when I go back to this, uh, the, the visible light image, I might think, okay, I think I see more stars in the spiral arms, but when I switch out to the infrared, uh, no, I think I see easily as many stars in between the spiral arms as mm -hmm. I see among the spiral arms. That to me is, is way cool. But you know, you come over here, you cross over to here and you get to this 
you get to this uh, train wreck going on down here. And just <laughs> again, I'm going to switch back here to the Hubble image, right? Okay, we see these we see these faint trails of gas. These are what are called tidal tails, right? Because these two galaxies here are merging, they're colliding. So they're throwing garbage out left and right. They're making a big mess of the place. They're throwing out these tidal tails. Boom, you go to the, uh, you go to the web image. Now you could see the front ends of those tails. You could see where all of these clouds are bashing into each other, kicking off all of the star formation. Again, the uh, level of yeah. detail here, man, is just, it, this is a trip. I mean, just look at all these knots. Look at all this mess. I so, love so it. So where it's all these beautiful. various clouds are colliding, that's causing densities to, you know, gravity to d bunch together, and that creates the yep. stars. Those are you. You get you get clouds that's a, that's merging. A birth place for stars. You got it. You got clouds merging. You got stars forming. It's just it's going to happen. There's mm -hmm. always going to be some over density somewhere. That's going to start contracting. And as it contracts, you know, it starts to be able to draw more gravity and it gets more gravitational pull. It brings more and more matter together. And next thing you know, you just got stars mm -hmm. poofing into existence, right? They're just, they're lighting up. Now, granted, I'm running the movie forward, you know, pretty fast, but still <laughs> on relatively short cosmic timescales, you're just getting crazy amounts of star formation. But the thing that really, really blew my mind, Joe, was, was uh, when we looked at this, image up here first of all again i, well, I should jump Hubble. in real quick if you're listening to this as the audio version you will be able to see what we're talking about if yeah, you go to the yeah. if you go to the youtube channel it's conversations with joe on youtube channel just yeah sorry about that yeah if you're listening no no, no uh, like a lot of people listen to it so i just want to make sure that uh, i totally got you right so what we're looking at now is a picture of the top galaxy in this in this image and i'm presently looking at the hubble space telescope version which really shows off you know, the, the, the nucleus and it has kind of like a bar shaped structure to it. And you can kind of see these trails of, of spiral ish arms. But mm -hmm. then when we go to the web image, now the, the, the nucleus is a little bit more exposed, but look at all those tidal tails that are getting tossed out as well. Like I didn't know those were there. You know, I was like, whoa, that is so freaking amazing. I thought that this <laughs> galaxy was like a perfectly happy, ordinary little galaxy just sort of watching the other two bash up and merge and making a mess of themselves while this one was just sitting there kind of to itself just sort of watching the show no no it's tidally disrupted as well you just see mm. so much wreckage going on there but the thing that really blew my mind was when you know what we're looking at right now is an image made with webb's near infrared camera right so near cam is what it's called right that's as the name implies it's looking at you know, shorter wavelengths of the infrared, but to really penetrate deep inside and go even further, you got to go to the mid infrared. And this is what Miri shows. And this is the part where I really went, whoa, because you see how bright, if you look mm -hmm. at that very same galaxy at the top there, the nucleus suddenly gets super bright. We go back to the web image, right? You know, we go back to, I'm sorry, to the near cam image, the nucleus is bright, but you don't appreciate just how insanely bright it is. Yeah, you don't. You, um, you get more of like a singular point to this. It feels like. Yeah, with it's those, those flares and everything. It's got the diffraction spikes. Yeah. And so whenever you've got something that's producing diffraction spikes like this, what that immediately tells you is that it's two things. It tells you that it's very compact, uh -huh. and it's it's very bright. Excuse me, and it's very compact. All right. So the fact that it's compact. Yes, we're talking about the black hole at the center of this galaxy. It turns out it's a very active black hole. It's feeding on the surrounding matter that's falling into it. And where is that matter coming from? Probably thanks to the tidal interactions from the train wreck below it, right? Mm. The two galaxies merging below it. So all this stuff is all these phenomena are influencing each other. And it's so, just... so the two galaxies are colliding. They're throwing off tons of debris and dirt mm -hmm. and dust and gas and stuff. And that's yeah. kind of colliding with this other galaxy and the black hole's just like, nom, 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 nom. and it's just, you got it. Yep. That black hole's like, Oh, goody wow. <laughs> snack time, you know? And it's, it's just having, that, that tells a, a story that that's, it that really does. lays it all out. That's interesting. Yeah. And, and we couldn't, again you know sure we understood that that's, this is probably what's going on but to be able to see it there's a huge difference between inferring it from what little you can make out in the visible part and seeing it very clear in the mid infrared 
Mm. Like, yeah, that story is right there, right in front of us. And then, of course, not for nothing, but then you've got like a whole freaking deep field thrown in the background for you. <laughs> yeah. You know, all these little tiny poofs of light, each and every one of them is a distant galaxy, you know. And and look, I mean, this 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 picture was designed to image Stefan's quintet, right? Like, OK, yeah, you know what? You're doing a uh, you're doing uh, Stefan's quintet, but not for nothing. But uh, there's a free deep field for you in the background if you want to, <laughs> you know, if you just want to have at it and like figure out like the history of star formation in the universe, like go knock yourself out. It's free. You know, yeah. it's like, cool. Yeah, so toss every in field a deep is a field with your purchase. <laughs> exactly, man. I mean, this is, I mean, look at that. Look at that. You got, and you know, you can see just, you can see spiral galaxies. You can see some of them that are edge on and they're just photobombing back there. And, and all those really red ones are the most furthest away. Right. Right. Most, they most can... furthest. I just said that most furthest. So the, the reddest of them can indicate two things, right? They can indicate, that number one, they are probably chock full of cooler gas and dust, right? Like things like hydrocarbons and soot and things like that. Some galaxies are just naturally more dusty than others. And that's going to really show up in those longest infrared wavelengths. But the other reason that they are red is what you just said. They're so far away, they're red shifted, right? The universe is expanding and it's actually taking that light and it's shifting it into the infrared mm -hmm. and so most of the galaxies that you see here are, you're not going to see in the hubble image not because hubble isn't a capable telescope but because it's not sensitive to the wavelengths at which those galaxies right. are are shining the brightest you know and i just love you can just go back and forth and just watch <laughs> You know, between the visible and the infrared, you can just watch these background galaxies pop out, go, hi, yeah, here we were hiding in plain sight. You know? So I, I mentioned in my video that some guy had made a tool. I forget his name, but it was a guy on Reddit made a, a tool uh, where you could slide back and forth between the two. Oh, I um, want that. Well, I guess he just kind of like made a whole website out of it. It's, it's webcompare.com. Nice. Um, and I'm guessing as new images come in, he'll... Uh, you know, do the, the Hubble web comparison with those two. Well, then, then he is. Oh, man, look at that. Oh, this guy's all right. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I love it. You know, so that's, that's, that's a free uh, promotion for webcompare.com. For everybody. Absolutely. Thank you, dude. That is that is wonderful. Definitely use web compare. Don't watch this guy with the Photoshop. You just uh, use web compare. <laughs> that's the same idea. Get the same idea yeah, it's the same idea, but it's just it's just a lot easier to use. A little bit um, more interactive. So this is the Southern Ring Nebula, okay? And, uh, okay, cool. You know, this is an image made with the Hubble Space Telescope right. in 1998, okay? And what do we have? Well, we have a pair of stars at the very center. Uh, let's see. It looks like we can zoom in on this. Oh, man, oh, man, can we zoom in on this? This is yeah, crazy. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Oh, wow, fantastic. Love it. So let's go <laughs> over here. We got a pair of stars. That we got a pair of stars in the center, okay? Uh, binary star system. The little faint guy is the white dwarf. That's the star that right. coughed out this nebula as it died. Well, here's what I love about this, because I was like, oh, yes, please. When you get to this image, I knew we were going to see, boom, look at all that stuff <laughs> that was tossed out, all that red gunk that was thrown out by the mm -hmm. star as it was dying and and this is what i love about this image because we're seeing so much more of the history of how this star checked out because when we look at planetary nebulae at visible light wavelengths and by the way planetary nebulae have nothing to do with planets it's just yeah yeah because we do things dumb in astronomy all the time like that we name things wrong but when you look at the planetary nebula you're looking at in the visible light you're seeing the hot gas that's ionized by the white dwarf at the center cool but we know that stars when they are before they become white dwarfs when they're still very late uh red giant stars we call them asymptotic giant branch stars or agb if you're one of the cool kids but anyway, AGB stars, <laughs> they they are undergoing severe convulsions near the end of their mm -hmm. lives. And with each convulsion, with each contraction and <clears throat> contraction and re-expansion, they're throwing more and more junk into space. They're throwing more and more of their own atmospheres away. We can't see that here because that stuff is that stuff left first. It is cooled off. It's become dust. So let me let me see if I'm understanding because I, I I've, yeah. I always have to clarify these things or, or verify it with experts because I sometimes I say things in videos and I'm like, was I actually right about that? Oh. 
Yeah, I feel like I'm talking out of my butt. Um, <laughs> but but, when, but it, it's basically when a star, like when when it starts to run out of fuel in the middle, that sort of balance between gravity and the force pushing out of the fusion reaction that's going on and everything, the the gravity starts to win, right? Right, and, and, and then it and... kind of throws off all these all the all the outer layers just start kind of flaking off, right? Yeah, it, it's a, it's right? kind of. No, you're on the right track. Uh, so what's happening, you're right. The star is exhausting a source of fuel. It's uh, no longer able to uh, produce energy. And so this is going to seem a little bit counterintuitive, but what's happening is that the core of the star starts to contract. It's no longer able to fuse, and therefore right. it's just like inert helium or inert carbon, whatever, sitting there in, in, the, in the very core. And so now the core starts to contract under its own weight. Well, it turns out if you take a gas and you squeeze it, that makes it hotter. So now the core, believe it or not, is radiating more heat energy, even though it's not fusing anything. And so that actually causes the outer layers to expand. So while the inner core is contracting, it's getting hotter, the outer layers expand, and then the core ignites that, you know, gets so hot it ignites that fuel. And you might be thinking, well, wow, now the core is crazy hot. Actually, no. Mm -hmm. Now the core is able to expand and cool itself so the outer layers contract. And then the star loses that source of fuel and the process repeats. The As it sort of fuses into bigger and bigger elements that you're saying. Right, right, exactly. Now in stars with like the mass of our sun, for example, dwarf stars, you know, they, they're gonna they're gonna pretty much stop the show at, at a carbon core. They're not gonna get mm. into much heavier elements, but stars that are a little bit more massive, they can go to neon and so forth. Well, anyway, uh, hand-waving my way through a lot of uh, stellar physics right now, I'll just say <laughs> that uh, what you end up with is you get to a situation where the star can't get its act together, right? It, its core becomes unstable. It's constantly, it's also surrounded, by the way, by a shell of fusing hydrogen, and that shell shuts down, and the core starts to uh, contract. And well, I'm sorry, the, the shell shuts down. The outer layers collapse a little bit because there's less energy pushing the pushing the outer envelopes. The shell reignites, and the outer envelopes expand. And with each, you know, that's one of those convulsion cycles where the outer shell surrounding the core keeps flickering off and on and off and on. And sometimes you got energy coming out, sometimes you don't. And the outer layers are responding accordingly. So now what you end up with is this rather unstable star that undergoes these series of these death throws. And with each of those convulsions, it expels more and more of its own outer shells, right? Just starts throwing the stuff out in space. So that stuff is expanding away. That's actually predating the planetary nebula. And uh, a star that's on this asymptotic giant branch can lose up to half of its mass this way. And that's what we're seeing here in this web image. We're seeing the rest of the story. We're seeing the prequel to the planetary nebula laid out in front of us. And, and it gets even better because this is a binary star system. There's two stars there. They're orbiting each other. While the star is having these constant fits it's orbiting it's with its companion so these two stars are kind of churning up all of this stuff and this is what's that's what created all these intricate crisscrossing patterns that we see here it's, it's just a beautiful uh really cool representation of the history of the star's demise and and i love how this this guy set this up we can we can zoom around here well, another thing it's uh i don't think he's got it but the um the white dwarf is actually lost. If you look in the very center, you see this really bright star and you got these beautiful diffraction spikes. Well, that's actually the companion star. That's mm -hmm. not the white dwarf. The white dwarf is actually lost in the glare yeah. of the companion. And I don't think he's got the... the mid I don't one. know if he's got the Miri version of this image, but when you go to the Miri version, boom, the, the companion star pops out. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah I don't it, think he's got that one on there. No, nah, but the... I probably have it in Photoshop, but anyway, it's cool. I mean, this is this is a great website. I love it. Yeah, it's neat. Yeah, I gotta tell people to go check this out. Well, that that Southern Ring Nebula, I don't know. It almost looks like you're looking at a at an oyster or something with a pearl in the middle, and and it's like there's, <laughs> I guess it's that blue sort of ionized gas is what you called it, but it, it almost looks like it's, it's the reflection of the light off of the the shell that it's that's around it or something. There's a little uh, I'm bit. I'm guessing of that. that's an optical illusion, but 
Right. So the way this is really actually oriented is, is if we could fly up, if we could fly out to it and then fly around to the side and look at it, you would see something that kind of looks like two bowls, you know, kind of like inverted, like with oh, the okay. backs of the bowls touching each other. Right. So there's kind of like there's basically like a thick ring of dust that surrounds this binary star system. And that that ring of dust has kind of channeled the outflow into like this huge like hourglass uh, shape. Okay. So we're kind of looking down the hourglass a little bit. Okay. Uh, but what happens here is that, um, again, you've got, you, well, actually to tell you the truth, a lot of that dust is visible right there in the, in the uh, web image, that red cooler dust. And so what happens is that as the star, remember I told you the story about how the star is throwing out layer upon mm -hmm. layer of its warmer atmosphere, creates, among other things, a bit of a dust ring because the star is rotating, the system's rotating, it kind of you know conserves angular momentum mm -hmm. and everything kind of forms a roughly ring-ish uh, shape around it. Okay. But now the star that's dying is having its core exposed to space. And now the, the core starts emitting this even hotter, faster, but also less dense wind, right? And that starts slamming in. It starts billowing in and plowing out okay. some of this uh, surrounding dust. And so, yeah, the, that bright ring that you see, the, the brightest part of the ring is, is because that wind is, is slamming into and shocking and ionizing the slower moving material. So it is glowing. So that is kind of what's happening. It's a little bit, yeah. Some of that yeah. light is, come, is, is literally bouncing off the walls of the ring <laughs> and the rest of it is is thanks to the raw ion the raw ionizing power of the exposed white dwarf because the white dwarf's like hundreds of thousands of kelvin i mean it's crazy hot so of uh, course it's going to radiate in the ultraviolet it's gonna it's nuking this thing man it's it's just a, wow. what a happy mess and i love the fact that you know we were talking before about free deep fields yeah even this image has a free deep field i mean look at these galaxies that are right here just sitting just <laughs> hanging out there photobombing like dude Dude, that's so cool. I mean, I don't think we even saw these in the uh, in the visible light images from Hubble. So, yeah, you know, it's weird to think about how like some galactic astronomers are going to be like, you know, I need some free web data. Let me go look at this planetary nebula and get some galaxies mm -hmm. there. <laughs> yeah. Just steal some. Oh yeah, for sure, man. It's you know, it's all good. But I love how I, lo I just it, this is just a shocking, shockingly beautiful. I again, this is what you were asking before about people being moved to tears. This mm -hmm. is why people get teared up because we knew we were going to see something different. We knew we were going to see something new. We didn't expect to see all this. We didn't expect to see this much clarity. Mm -hmm. We didn't expect all of this fine detail. It's, it's pretty, but it also tells an incredible story, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I, I, I think it's great that we're just, we're here, we're alive to, to see it and, yeah. and, uh, and learn about it. Oh, well, that's kind of, that was the crux of my video when I was talking about it was just like, it just, we oh, get, yeah. we get good news so rarely. And there were so many ways this could have gone wrong and it actually Absolutely. just nailed it. And we're getting things we didn't even expect to see. And yeah. It, just... it shows what people can do when they decide to work together and, and get things done, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and troubleshoot problems. So yeah, it, it, it's a, it's a great story. I thought you just did just a wonderful job with your video, Joe. Yeah, I well, just thanks. loved it. I, I kind of threw it together, honestly. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't normally cover like uh, news stories. I try to do more evergreen stuff just because like the window for getting a, a yeah. video made at this point with the process I've got going on, it's weeks, you know? So um, I just kind I'm, of tossed that together and I guess I waxed philosophical in just the right way. Maybe I I, You did. You did a wonderful job. You know, actually I tried to do that, but I, I, I can't, I just can't. I, I, I'm like, no, I got to research this some more. No, I got my power back on. Um, I really got to go back and make sure I'm not saying something wrong. And so it takes me so yeah, you, long. You had a few hurdles this week, I would say. I, it was a stressful week, but I'm, <laughs> but I'm, I'm almost done editing the video and uh, I hope I can have that out by Monday. So. Oh, well, yeah. then that'll be out by the time people see this easily. Cool. Great. Excellent. So go, go watch, go watch the video <laughs> as soon as you're done with this. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, um, it's been wonderful with web. So you have, it sounded like you said that you have uh, seen the, the, the manifest, so to speak of the different uh, projects that web is going to be working on. Like, is there yeah. anything coming out that you're like super excited about? Um, well there, yeah. Uh, one thing that I'm, I was, so I was really happy to see that uh, spectrum of an exoplanet. Mm, now I yeah, realize yeah, yeah. spectra aren't sexy, but again, when you understand, once you take a moment to understand what 
what that specter is telling you, you're just like, whoa, this yeah. is incredible. So um, and just the fact I'm, that they can do that just with the sliver of, of atmosphere that's yeah. around the planet that they can like exactly. discern. That. That's amazing to me. Passes Sorry, through, right. The, no, you're right. You're on the money. Yeah. It, it, the, the starlight passes through the atmosphere. We can get absorption lines. And, and this is a technique that we've known about for a, for a long time. This is not a new technique, but again, all of those important absorption lines that you really want to see if they're there or not, things like water, carbon dioxide, methane, uh, you know, ammonia, things like that, those strong, their strongest absorption lines are going to be in the infrared part of the spectrum. So to get this beautiful spectra of WASP-96b and just see those water absorption lines, that right there was a really nice, uh, I was kind of glad that they did this because prior to this, when all quote, all we had were the, you know, like the, the optical and maybe some near infrared from the ground. They, they saw some lines, but they were like, huh, this probably doesn't have any clouds in the atmosphere. How, how does a planet have a truly cloudless atmosphere? That never really made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Well, sure enough, the water clouds were hiding in plain sight in the infrared. And that's what those water vapor absorption lines okay. tell us. So we're seeing the signature of water vapor clouds. That doesn't mean that the planet's, you know, got life in it. It's a, it's a jet gas giant. It's not a very habitable place, but we can do that. Now, this that particular planet was chosen because it has a big, large, puffy atmosphere. So it's relatively easy to get an exoplanet spectrum like that in a relatively quick amount of time because yeah. you, you got to remember they just finished commissioning the instruments okay let's turn this around let's get these early release observations out so the public can mm -hmm. see what they paid for but you know what they're going to do is that they're going to now with more observation time if you take longer uh, exposures and you get more spectral data it's going to take you longer to get that spectral data and it's going to take you longer to analyze it but you know what you can do with more time and more light you can look at thinner atmospheres the atmospheres of Earth-sized planets. And there are observations planned for Webb to begin to tease out the atmospheric property of terrestrial-sized exoplanets. Now, that's exciting. You yeah, know, we've yeah. only done that just a little bit here and there. To be able to go in <clears throat> really deep and start getting the transmission spectra of potential Earth-like worlds, who knows? You know, I mean, it, it's it, astronomers are very unlikely to say we found life on a planet, you know, but yeah. but I would not be surprised if we start to detect uh, the some of the so-called biomarkers that we are looking for. Yeah. And what, what, what would those be? I know there's oxygen, water. Right. Oxygen, CO2. water, a little bit of CO2 is a good thing. Um not too much, but a little bit. Uh, so, night. Well, let's take a look at our atmosphere. Okay. Yeah, so we. I just assume we'd be if, looking if, for what right. we've got. Yeah. If you exactly, that's the simplest biomarker we yeah. can think of, right? Because we know that we know that this atmosphere works. So, what will we find? As you said, oxygen, right? Water, uh, nitrogen, because we do live in the nitrogen, but we breathe mostly nitrogen, it's right? Mostly nitrogen, yeah. Trace amounts of carbon dioxide, right? A little bit of methane. Methane is again, that's the one that really gets people excited because that usually is you know, that's farted out by, by uh, animals and stuff like yeah. that. It doesn't mean that there's life there. It just means that, Hey, these are the biomarkers. These are the things that you would expect to see if there's life there. Yeah. The challenge with biomarkers, of course, is that you can produce them non-biologically, right? Uh, but can we find planets with similar ratios or at least see how they compare to earth? I mean, that's mm -hmm. something that, that, uh, I know I'm looking forward to from the exoplanet uh, community from Webb. And they're also going to take a look at that TRAPPIST system. I was about to bring up TRAPPIST, yeah. TRAPPIST is on TRAPPIST is on the docket for cycle one of, oh, of cool, the observations. Cool. Yeah, TRAPPIST is on the docket, as is Proxima Centauri B. Mm -hmm. That's also on the, uh, on the manifest for the first year of observations. And that is our closest exoplanet, right? That's the closest... Uh, planetary system that we may be able to get a glimpse of someday mm -hmm. if we ever can pull star shot off or something like that you know right. let's start characterizing those worlds um recently an, another target that's on the cycle one uh manifest that i'm looking forward to is uh you know a couple of months ago we heard about this really cool star that was found in a gravitational lens arendelle well Webb's going to look at it 
And hmm. it's going to see if it can really pin down whether or not this truly is a star or if it was something else. Because if it's a star, uh, the key thing about this Arendelle object that was located in the gravitational lens, it means it's very, very far away. It means that we are looking at a star that no longer exists. It undoubtedly has completely okay. self-destructed in a supernova. But the, if we could go back and see this thing clearly with Webb, who knows, maybe we have a shot at catching one of the first stars to form in the universe. Fingers crossed. Wow. Cool. I, okay. I didn't know the name of it, but I'd heard something about like the oldest yeah. star ever found possibly. And I guess that's what it was that you were talking about. That's Ar it. Arendelle. What a great name. Yeah. It comes that from. It feels uh, very Tolkien-esque. Well, Tolkien did use that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there was. Yeah. Uh, so it comes from Old English, which means morning star. Uh, and uh, Tolkien had a character in one of his books that referred to you know, carrying the, the more the, the star Arendelle, the light of the star. It's an elf wizard. And I'm and all the Tolkien fans are are just furious at me right now for not remembering off the top of my head because I, I can't remember. <laughs> They're screaming at their at their I steering know. wheel right now. Sorry guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'll forgive you. All right. Thank you. Just appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Um, Be Becky would know it. Becky would have it. She'd she'd nail that down. And this is why she makes me look like a chump. You know, she a Tolkien was, freak? Oh yeah, she knows she? her stuff. Know oh, her. she knows her stuff. Oh man, she you know she's British. She has to know. <laughs> she she knows her stuff. That's that's just I I can't compete with that. <laughs> well, this is kind of fun because um I had her on right after it launched, I believe it was oh, cool. not long after it because I remember she said that she was they were they were calling it squeaky bum time because uh, it was like it, <laughs> yeah. it had gone up and it was like uh, is it gonna fall you know all the stuff was unfolding it was like you know oh. Yeah nervous breakdown every day um so that was when i talked to her and so now that it, we've got the pictures back i'm talking to you so oh i and i i'm i'm well i think all of us were having a little bit of that i don't want to say anxiety i i, I never oh i, mean, I was having anxiety well i'm not even know, like in that field yeah i mean that's true it's only it's only my career for the you know <laughs> <laughs> uh that's potentially on the line here but uh no i mean i, I was uh i guess i just by that point, I, I had just become familiar enough with yeah. how this was being put together, how this was being worked. And, and actually having worked in uh, spacecraft operations myself, I worked with the Hubble Space Telescope uh, after the first servicing mission when they corrected the optics. But I was actually, I, I'm sorry, I got there before the first servicing mission. Uh, so I, I joined the Hubble program while the optics were still screwed up. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I wasn't going to have a job if this servicing mission didn't go remember that very well yeah. yeah so i guess i had been through squeaky bum <laughs> situations before and Your i bum just, was already squeaky clean i was already squeaky clean so i knew uh, comparing all of those lessons that were learned the hard way with hubble were worked into the design with web mm. and i could i i i just had the utmost faith that they were going to get this done and it worked that does not mean, however, that I was not tremendously excited yeah. when, when it just worked, just, you know, chef's kiss, perfect, boom, you know, everything just worked out so well. They made it look easy, you know, and, and that's, that's, what, that's, what the, that's what pros can do. They can make the hard things look yeah. easy. And they did it. They did such a beautiful job. Well, once so, it was inserted into the, the orbit um, and they were talking about just how perfectly ESA nailed it with the launch and everything and like we're okay. gonna get like 20 years out of it now instead of maybe five <laughs> to ten it was just like oh my god like so much credit you know i i uh i was so thrilled with that with that news uh i i kind of had a feeling that they were going to oh you're telling me it needs to work for five years okay we're gonna make sure it works for 20 like you know <laughs> no engineer wants to be that person that uh, short shorted uh web's uh mission but you're right isa's launch was perfect on the money really could not have been any better mm -hmm. and and that just saved them loads and loads of gas getting out to l2 so yeah. just wow <laughs> perfect job so the vera rubin observatory this is a ground-based telescope that's being built in the high desert in chile and its job is not to look at one target and then look at another target or anything like that. It's actually a huge survey telescope. So it's actually just going to take one image and then move a little bit, take another image, move a little bit, and just keep repeating this. Yeah. And then over the course of like, what, three or five days, it's going to cover the entire night sky. And then it's going to repeat it again. It's going to do, it's going to go back and start over again and keep covering the sky. So 
anything that happens in the sky, whether it's a supernova that goes off or whether it's a, 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 a nearby asteroid that's passing us by at high speed, or if there's something moving in the distant outer solar system that we didn't know about before, Rubin stands a really good chance of catching it. And, and that's really what it's there for. It's to do what's called time domain astronomy, which is basically things that are happening on very short time scales. You know, we're going to be able to see the sky changing and, and see what's happening uh, in real time, as close to real time as we could possibly get it. And uh, I know that one of the one of the big targets that it's hoped that Rubin can find would be the long sought after Planet Nine. Yeah. You know, the, the the one that Mike Brown and Constantine Batigan uh, figured out has or should is likely to be there all the way back in 2016. And you could argue, well, cheats. You know, it's been eight years. How come they? You know, how come they haven't found it yet? Well, it turns out that's hard to do. You know, it's a the sky's very big, you know, and planets are very, very small on the sky. So having a this dedicated way out there too, right? Like past the Kuiper belt and oh, way out there. Yeah. yeah. We're we're talking on the order of hundreds of astronomical units. Yeah. So um an astronomical unit, you know, that's the distance between Earth and the sun. And to give you some sense of scale, Neptune is about 30 AU. Uh the Kuiper belt extends to about 50, maybe 55 AU. Planet nine is probably on orbit measuring on the order of like, I think five to 600 AU, yeah. you know? So it's, it's, it's out there. It's way, this is a distant outer solar system, which is a yeah. region that we really don't have a whole lot of data on, but we're, but Ruben's going to help us learn a lot more about that. So yeah, there there's, it's funny too, because yeah, you're right. Like, you know, ground-based telescopes don't get all the love uh, that space-based telescopes yeah. get. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, is that, you could, you know, you can ask the question, well, why would you bother building space telescopes when you can build these enormously larger ground-based telescopes? And then you can ask the question in reverse, right? Why bother the ground-based telescopes when you can build space-based telescopes? And the answer is because no, no one telescope does it all. There is no such thing as a perfect telescope. There's different tools for different jobs, like anything else in life. So I think you have these telescopes working together. Telescope model there. I think that's what that is. Oh, yeah. So behind me, right, this is the Giant Magellan Telescope. Hmm. Uh, so the folks at uh, the folks at GMT very kindly sent me that little model there. Hmm. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a 20, that's a 25 meter telescope. It's got seven enormous single monolithic mirrors that yeah. that are all going to work together, you know. So, yeah, that's a, that's an exciting project as well. So we're starting to see like a new, you know, I don't want to say a new golden age because that's almost cliche, but we're starting to see like a resurgence. <laughs> like for a while there, we were building like all these big telescopes in the 1990s and then we kind of stopped. Mm. Now we're getting back to it, right? You know, Europe, Europe is building the 30 meter tele, I'm oh, sorry, the, the, not 30 meter, the, extre the, the extremely large telescope, yeah. right? That's a 39 meter telescope. Uh, we have the 30 meter telescope that we'd like to build in Hawaii. And now we've got the giant Magellan telescope. Yeah. So yeah, we're going to see some big glass coming down the pike. That's cool. I, I read about, um, don't they, I know that there's a, a, a lab under the stadium at the university of Arizona where they make yeah. those giant mirrors and stuff. Yep. And I would, I would love to go visit that and shoot. Me there. too. Really Me cool. too. I think, I think maybe, maybe you and I should, you know, like sign a write a letter together and say hey we have we have we have we have an enormous channel and there's also launch pad astronomy but we have this enormous <laughs> youtube channel that would like to do a thing at, well, you, you the... carry more clout for sure as a natural <laughs> astrophysicist. well you know between the two of us we should be able to figure something out and yeah. you know field trip you know and 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 uh yeah that'd be a, that'd be a fun collab <laughs> you, you've got the bra i've got the bra <laughs> Let's make. Let's awesome. look at giant mirrors. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, baby. Yeah. Well, you know they are they are building the. Uh, let's see, I think they're still making some of the mirrors. I mean, th these mirrors take months and months and months to make, uh, just to make the mirror blank. Sorry, just to. It takes even longer to polish them and turn them into, you know, telescope quality glass. So. Yeah. So I yeah, love the idea that they're doing that like underneath the football field. <laughs> you know? Yeah. All yeah. this it's spectacle all... and all this stuff, and underneath right. they're doing this like amazing they're science high precision engineering yeah. and there's like all hell breaking loose on the same right. I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> chaos I, above you know that's actually an interesting question I, i'd like i would love to ask if how they manage that like okay is it a problem you know if there is a game running because they're they're spin casting these mirrors for months and months at a time do they only do it when 
when you know during the off season of football or mm-hmm. can they continue to spin cast these mirrors even while there's a game playing this is the kind of stuff that i i i need to know well there's some amazing engineering there yeah i mean regardless it's it's it's, it's cool yeah it's cool and i'm not an engineer but look i like hardware i like big telescopes i cannot lie you know come on i mean i you know <laughs> well i i did a video way back on the possibility of putting sun shields in orbit between the earth and sun for climate change reasons and stuff. Yeah. And, and I yeah. think, is it Roger Angel, the guy who runs that lab? He actually wrote a paper on like how that would work. Okay. Uh, but it's the oh, same cool. guy who's making like the giant Magellan telescope mirrors. He had an idea for how to do sunshades in space. So, wow. I mean, I hope it doesn't come to that, but it's good to know that we're thinking about that, you know, because we may have to. You know, so, well, the 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 point of my video is that it would be like this most ridiculous mega project that's ever existed. It would just, yeah, it would, it would what is it, some like seventeen million launches would be required or something to, to <laughs> even cover like two percent of the the sun that's coming. Oh, out. it's crazy. Yeah, it, it it's it would take an enormous amount of material and effort, and and honestly, you almost makes you think, okay. It's good to know that someone's thinking about this, but if we are too stupid to fix this problem and we decide and to the point, you know, if we're too stupid to like avoid having to go down that path and we've really done it wrong, mm. you know? Well, and also I think just, just all the, all the carbon emissions that would be created doing all that would yeah. like out, offset everything that we've done. Exactly. Was, I mean, yeah, it was an enlightening video to work on, and it was kind of fun, kind of digging into the numbers and everything. But at the same time, it's just like, Ugh, this is yeah, not even going to work. Unless <laughs> we did it from the moon, that was my conclusion. If we could like automate, that's right, building things and launching them off of the moon, then maybe, maybe, yeah, that that's would be your would be that. That's a maybe. But again, if we get to the point where we have to start blocking out the sun, you know, mm-hmm. we we've done it wrong. Yeah, you know. And, and, and I think we can do better. And I, I know we can do better. Look, we put the freaking, you know, this is going to be, so we're talking about the Webb telescope, right? I mean, we, how many times have we said it? If they could put a man on the moon, if they could put a man on the moon, if they could build the James Webb Space Telescope, to me, it's that level of, mm-hmm. of achievement. We can do things. We can solve problems. The problem is there's no um, monetary incentive mm-hmm. for doing a yeah. lot of these things. Oh, yeah. And that's a big reason that's how everything works you know uh, was it was it george carlin who was saying i i, I caught I, so I caught that carlin documentary on hbo do you see I that see it no i haven't yet. oh you've got to see it. it's incredible it's just it's so well done uh judd apatow uh directs it by the way and uh i think there was like one segment where there was a clip of carlin talking about like you know we could solve all these problems we could do this we could do that we can't solve homeless you know why because there's no money in it right we can't take we can't there's no money in putting homeless people in homes. So, you know, it's like, hmm, really? I guess maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. I want to do a similar video to that, um, uh, that, that uh, Sun Shields video that I was talking about, where I really dig into the numbers and see how it would all work and everything, but just on, uh-huh. on creating a global thermostat, because Mm. there's all the people that are like well you know the climate's always changing it's always been changing and and uh, you know and they're, and they're right about that if you look back through yes. the history there's been all these yeah. species that have been wiped out for various reasons and climate uh, disturbances and whatnot well so why don't we just we have the technology to do this why not why don't we just find a way to stabilize our climate by regulating what goes in and out greenhouse gas wise i mean we have the ability to take co2 out of the air obviously uh-huh. that to be like a mega project i'm i'm, I'm sure yeah. i'm making it sound way easier than it actually oh is, yeah yeah you, like you, it's something you, we could you, do you, know? you just take the co2 out of the air yeah you know? <laughs> it's like reverse but, breathing you know <laughs> it's like if we really yeah. want this to be a stable planet to live on for millions of years to come that's probably something we're going to have to no, I, I think you're right. I think I think it it would ultimately, I mean, so it goes back to a little bit about what I was saying before. Like, yeah, we we probably could that do that, but at the same time, if we just stopped putting more CO two into the air, um, then eventually that CO two is going to have to start work. It's going to work its way out naturally. Yeah. Now, ha- on what the time scales and so forth, I, I I don't know. I'm not a climate scientist. I'm way further out of my lane, but <laughs> I'll say that uh, yeah, I mean, you could in theory. Just stop putting CO2 into the air at the rates that we're doing it and let nature take its course. And then gradually those rates will come down. 
I think though you're right. I think it's going to probably necessitate some form of geoengineering uh, to extract more carbon than we currently are. And there are technologies out there that are doing that, mm. um, but you know, scaling that up, and that's a, that's always a key thing. It's one thing to have a technology; it's another thing to scale it up and make it feasible. So, yeah, if we can do that, yeah, then it's a, a long road from the lab to the store. Yeah, but that sounds like something that our ludicrous future should uh, should, should investigate. You know, I think that's your. Yeah, I think that's your. I think that's your one eventually. <laughs> that that sounds like your topic, you know, and uh, yeah. Of course, we're we're more like just here's what we saw uh, on on our Facebook feed today. Um, <laughs> let's talk about that. So it's more yeah, like our okay. ridiculous present, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, our, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, well, I didn't want to keep you all day long, and we had a little technical snafu that kind of put us yeah, all right. like in the middle of all this. But um, what else? Is there anything else you wanted to chat about? I mean, I, 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 I know that your video on uh, JWST uh, is already out by the time people hear this. So I, would I hope so. Boy, at, at, at the rate it takes me to edit a video, good grief! Yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, I'm in the middle of finishing that right now. So I'm doing a, I'm doing like a breakdown of of the images, basically kind of like what you did. You know, it's mm -hmm. just another yet another one of those. But, you know, there's so much information there. I, I, I probably going to have to go back and then do like some closer look, further in depth videos and just like one of those images or some, you know, I mean, I because there, there's a so much, so much incredible detail there. So, yeah, there's going to be and, you know, I think I, I kind of think that they're going to be releasing more and more images from Web. Like, I don't think they're going to quit while they're ahead. I think they're going to continue to do this like, you know, forever, yeah, like yeah. just like the middle level. So there's a whole lot more coming to talk about, and it's uh, I'm I'm just I'm just glad that I got it. I'm I'm able to to throw a couple of uh, comments out there and and uh, make a video about it and just talk about the stuff because I, I kind of like the stuff, you know. It's it's like it's, it's in my blood. Yeah. Yeah. I've been doing this since I was 13 years old, and you know, I why why stop now? Well, this is just a, a new generator of content for you. That's all. That's all. JD it sure is. is. It, it sure is. I look at it and I say, yes, <laughs> I can get views. No, I mean, <laughs> like, this no, is career it, longevity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, no, seriously, I, 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 I look at this and I, I just get so excited and so happy that um, we have this, this, I know it's cliche, you hear it all the time. Oh, it's a new window in the universe, but that's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a new window in the universe. It's a new way to see things. And yes, if we can appreciate some nice things about you know from time to time then i think you're right i think we can the world can become a better place mm -hmm. as long as enough people can look up occasionally or you know look beyond yeah you know the 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 the, the small picture stuff that we deal with in our daily lives yeah. well sort of connected to that this just reminded me when, when you were talking yeah. earlier about like um uh, teaching your classes and kind of getting people who were never really exposed to it before and weren't interested suddenly they're interested in it and that kind of uh -huh. thing and obviously as a content creator and a science communicator that's kind of your bread and butter now that's what you do but I, I would love to hear if you had any insights to I mean after after dealing with or, or, or working with uh, kids and people who maybe weren't interested and became interested it, it, have you seen any patterns in the kind of things that do get people excited about it or the, the what what does flip on the light switch the most for for people if there if there is anything that comes to mind um i think when people well you know one thing that i always do uh it, it, at the very beginning of my class is i'm i try to give people like an orientation to the universe and i just do a simple tour of the universe mm -hmm. you know we start off at earth and we're just expanding out further and further and further and usually that right there sets off a few I could see the eyes popping mm -hmm. a little bit, you know, um, it's maybe something that they have seen before, but nevertheless, it seems like every time people are confronted with just the sheer scale of everything, um, you know, they, they complain about having existential crises and so forth, but I always like to remind them, yes, you are extremely small and yes, you're extremely insignificant, but so is the entire planet earth so is the sun so is the solar system so is the even the galaxy even our super cluster of galaxies everything is small on a large enough scale what that's that should not be the, the issue the issue is that you are made of the same kinds of stuff 
and you obey the same laws of nature. You, you know, you, you are governed by the same laws of nature as every, as the largest galaxy, as the largest member of the superclusters and so forth. So the point is that at some level, scale no longer matters. What matters is that you're here and you're in the universe and the universe is as much a part of you as you are a part of it. And usually that sometimes, you know, that, that varies obviously from one person to another, but a lot of times people get the, a little bit more of like an aha, like, oh, I don't have to feel small and insignificant. Mm -hmm. No, don't let it go to your head either, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but, you know, no, let's be thankful that we're here, that we're able to be an assemblage of parts of the universe that came together to make up you and me and gave, and somehow we got this thing called consciousness. Mm -hmm. And we have, perhaps even more importantly, we have some curiosity about the universe and we can go and learn about it. And when people, usually that's something that I think gets through to a lot of people, uh, typically on day one of my class, and then it's all downhill from there. <laughs> because i think at the first remember time. things and yeah exactly and stuff <laughs> um well you mentioned hank green earlier i think he just did a, a video um uh, that was about the the james webb images and uh he was saying something about like that that bigness size is not the right uh scale to be uh -huh. thinking about it's really more about complexity that yeah. you know that that these these atoms formed this ability to be conscious and curious about the universe and that that complexity that we're seeing here and that order, I guess, that naturally doesn't really occur. It's kind of, well, I guess it does naturally occur. Well, it does naturally occur. Here we are, right. But, um, but it anyway, normally yeah, wouldn't but it's occur. That complexity that's that's really what you should be thinking about. And what that's a really good, that's a really good point. Yeah, you know, you know, you're right. You're not going to get a galaxy to become conscious. You're not going to get a star or even a planet to uh you know, to, to, to have any sense of self. Mm -hmm. And yet here we are, these, these quote unquote tiny creatures. And yeah, you're right. We've got this strange, awesome arrangement of, of atoms that just allow us to do a podcast. You know, and you know, what's even crazier is now we are taking rocks out of the ground and making them think. What? Computers. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yes. We're, we're okay. pulling things out of the ground and rearranging those to make them think. Exactly. Right. We we could we can we can change our environment and if the person from Google is correct, uh they have now have feelings <laughs> as well. It's like, ooh, okay. So yeah. so I just like to be on the record of saying that I for one welcome our uh robot overlords. Robot uh, overlords. You know, yeah. <laughs> uh You're so not yeah. the guy in that video kicking Atlas over. No, no, that's that, not me. That wasn't you. That was the other guy. No, that wasn't me. Uh but um I'll tell you one thing that I do at, at uh, Towson University. I'm also the director of the planetarium uh, down there. So I, I really enjoy, uh, you know, showing people the sky and creating that immersive experience. So, so yeah, uh, I, I, I do a few things. Uh, I teach, I do planetarium shows, and once in a while I make a video on YouTube. <laughs> uh you're doing good stuff I, I think that's 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 really cool and um, well, thank you the, the fact that um you're still as passionate about it now as you were back when you were working on hubble i think is kind of like you said it's in your blood yeah you can you can yeah, really, take the yeah. hubble you can take the hubble out of the man but you can't take the man out of the way <laughs> <laughs> i didn't get that exactly that's yeah right. I, I that's okay and that was made an effort was made and 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 I and I salute you for it, sir. I see that. <laughs> well, I salute you and I appreciate you coming on and uh I appreciate like having your perspective on uh on these images and everything. Um so I would encourage everybody to go check you out. Any last words? Thank you so much for having me on the show. And uh as I always like to say at every one of my videos, you know, just stay curious, my friends. I mean, that's the most important thing we we have is our curiosity. That was nice. Thank you so much to Christian for taking time to chat uh, and sharing his expertise with me. Like you can appreciate these images for what they are, obviously, but uh, you know, it's really cool when you can get in front of an expert who can really get down to the nitty gritty and really explain to you all the really mind blowing stuff that's in these images. It was really cool. Uh, so Christian now has a couple of videos on the web photos on his YouTube channel. So definitely go check those out. He goes a little bit deeper than what we talked about here. Um, and also just check out the rest of his channel. It's called Launchpad Astronomy. It's really good stuff. 
This episode was produced by Kimmy Britt, edited by Bray Brown. I'm Joe Scott. You can find me at Answers with Joe pretty much everywhere on the socials. Of course, my YouTube channel is Answers with Joe. Anyway, thanks a lot for listening. Please do share this if you thought it was interesting and a nice review on whatever podcast player you're using right now. It really goes a long way. But until next time, thanks. Have a good one. Now go out there and start some conversations of your own. Take care.